some, Unmuted. some species, for example, like a, a jellyfish, as well as forage schooling fish, those are like the, they are important for the ecosystem, but so far we don't have any good ways to sample them, okay? Then in that part, I will talk about uh, uh, first Atlantic manhating. This is a forage like pelagic schooling fish, coastal spawners, and we'll talk, talk more about the life history in detail uh, in, in, the, in the rest of the talk. The next part will be, the second example will be sea nettles. And uh, the ecological concept will go through the underlying ecological concept for those, for those two studies in the talk. And then I will show some examples for some key species like mices that we, have, we were able to see using the sonar imaging system. Then I will introduce, just briefly mention the new toys that I, we just got. It's a 4D PIA system, allows us to better study uh, the trophic interactions between different organisms, allow us to quantify their swimming behavior as well as their interactions in, the, in a particular volume. Okay. So, okay. So now I'm moving into the optical, optical system part. Uh, so the optical system for plankton actually has been around for quite a while. Uh, as far as we can date it back to 1970s or even earlier. The earliest part, of course, was using like the film, of still cameras still using film to work on the to take pictures of different plankton underwater. And then back in 1980s, at late 1980s, uh, with VPR, video plankton recorder designed by Huyi, start to gain a lot of momentum. Then nowadays, even in the market, video plankton recorder are still available and there are other systems, underwater video, video profiler and in situ exu plankton recorder. There are many different systems out there. But if we look at the systems, the majority of the system work really well in, in clear water, in, other, in deep water. For example, the, the VPR that was initially used to, to study the plankton abundance in George Speck. And uh, you look at the other, most of the other applications there are in sort of like in clear, in you know deeper water or somewhat clear water. So, however, coastal water where the turbidity tends to be high, this is the area is with a lot of like fish resources, about like 90 90 percent of the total catch uh, in the world is from this region. And this include estuary. If you look at it, of course, when we deploy the system, we want this kind of water. It's crystal, crystal clear, the system can work well. But most of the time, this is what we have when you have river plume comes in with a lot of sediment loading in there. And this is also very common. So the question is like, can the optical system actually work in those environment? So this is a, is an example we took from the Chesapeake Bay. In the upper bay, what you can see is like the image basically was, was saturated with all particulates. When I go through those images, this was taken back in uh, 2013 when I first tested uh, our system in the Chesapeake Bay. If you look at it, it's like you can see copepods with tentacles showing up, but the, their main body was hiding behind the particulates. So those are the circumstances like correspondent here. You know, you have heavy sediment loading, your, like, your water clarity was, was very low and the turbidity mostly caused by the non-organic sediment loadings. In other words, you put your hand down to like 10 centimeters, you couldn't see your hands. That's, that's where the system still has a limitation. However, when you move to those waters, like here, 
somewhat like already mixed. Here, this is an example. You can see that's where this, we collected some of the waters with similar turbidity like that. You can, you can still see Copas was jumping around and you can actually see it. So that's what we did in the lab. We collected some samples, minimic those turbidities, see if we can get the system to work. So this is sort of like the first step we took showed that conceptually this could work in relatively high turbidity water. So the next part here, those three slides, uh, three figures, pictures showing, those are all original pictures, are just make it fit in the screen. So you can see the barnacles. Within this, this picture, you, if you zoom in, you can see a lot of like diatoms in there. And uh, some of them are noctiluca, like this one. If you focus, zoom in, each of individual black dots is a noctiluca. This is when the Noctiluca bloomed in Shenzhen Bay. Well, I will use that as an example for a monitoring program. Here, this is again from Shenzhen Bay where we tested the system. You can see a lot of like forage fish coming into the field. And when you zoom in, you see a lot of like sediment par particulates in the, in the water column. Uh, the trick is, the question here is, can I use the pointer to point, point to the figure? But the pro problem is like, if I use a pointer, the remote party cannot see the pointer. They can see the mouse. The remote, those who tune online will not be able to see the pointer. So I guess I will try to see do both, okay. So just to give a brief idea, here is a system, all different kinds of plankton imaging systems that has been, you know, are available. And uh, I highlight a few that in the same category as the one we are using that use the same pr principles. Those are called shadow graph imaging systems. Uh, the working principle is relatively simple. You just, uh, if you think about, you use flashlight, you stand in between the flashlight and the wall, you leave a shadow on the, on the wall. Uh, of course, it sounds simple, but when you implement it, it's going to, it's actually much more complex than that. You have to first make your light source becomes a par parallel light, then light attenuation in high turbidity water is a problem. So there are a lot of things you need to consider. And within this category, there are two types of system. One type is using line scan camera. The other type use CCD camera. So line scan camera, as you can think about it, is just do scanning line by line. It requires you towing the system all the time at certain speed. And if for stationary deployment, it's going to be difficult. For example, for some of our application, we mounted the system on a fixed point. We do sort of like a, uh, intensive fixed point observations. Then the system is not, the line scan camera is not going to work. So we choose a, a, a CCD camera, the high density contrast CCD camera for this, for our particular work. So the, here, those the lower part basically are the are the the example from different systems. You can see they uh, depending on the background. So, but they all show different organisms quite well. Okay. So this is a kind of like a just give a brief idea the development of our, of our system. Again, this starting from the working principles, point source, point source to parallel light. Then you have camera on, on this side. And uh, this, the lower, lower here, lower figure 
shows the original Zulis DSR system is weighs roughly 550 pounds. It took, it's actually took, took four people to lift it, pretty tough. And uh, uh, this is what we deployed it this summer in the Bering Sea. Uh, it, uh, we were able to collect roughly 15 terabytes plankton imaging si system from 10 day deployment. deployment. And uh, here, this is the system we have right now. Is, uh, is roughly weighs 120 pounds. The reason for this particular system is a self-contained, self-recording, self-powered. So everything is in here, inside. So you tell the system just like you tell a CTD. Then coupled with a CTD, you get depths and images at particular depths. With GPS, you get the uh, geolocation. So you got the 3D distribution. And uh, the beauty of the system is you can actually use it on small boat, does not require any power, does not require any fiber optics. And uh, however, we recognize it's too, too heavy to, act, to be actually deployed on small boat. That's actually the, the second generation of Zuvis. Now we move on to this one. We were able to take advantage of the, uh, the newer lens that put out by Optin and using other light source, uh, we design our own light source in this part, then we were able to compact everything inside two pressure housing. This weighs roughly 120 pounds. So you can imagine how, how much work is actually behind of this, like the, this process. So the beauty of the system, shadow graph imaging system, of, co of course it has large field field view, allow you to see things ranging from plankton, phytoplankton, large phytoplankton to larval fish. And uh, it also has long depths of field because there, in, in this, this version of the system, we have roughly 17 centimeters of the depths of field are in, is in focus. And uh, for this one, because we use an existing lens, like a commercial lens, it has a relatively shallow field of lens. Uh, I mean, for those who do not study like plankton or biology, is just a, a quick note is here, because we care a lot about sampling volume. We, for larger organisms, we want to have large sampling volumes. For example, when we sample phytoplankton, we use smaller net. We sample zooplankton, we use relatively larger net. When we sample juvenile fish, we use even bigger net. If you go, say, commercial fishery for adult fish, they use huge nets, probably put this building inside of the net. So that's why we care so much about the sampling volume. Then it turns those two things. Number one, the large field of view. Number two is depth of field. Those two gives you the sampling volume you need. And uh, it also allows us to cover the relatively high resolution as allows us to cover a wide range of different organisms. I will show you the example actually right here. Then it because it's using parallel light, you pr it preserves the size information. So if someone is working on say, the size spectrum theory, this can provide information on that too. If you look at here, this upper panel here, those are actually different organisms from the Gulf of Mexico. And then this is from Chesapeake Bay. You can see the difference, right? Gulf of Mexico has a lot of different species and uh, clear background, much higher image quality. But in Chesapeake Bay, not so much. But still, like you can even see the internal structure of the tinnifers and uh, hydromedusa here. And uh, the lower panel, again, again, is from Shenzhen Bay. Those are the forage fish species. Okay. So uh, this one, those are the organisms we just collected uh, freshly out of the Bering Sea 
in during our June, July, June cruise. So you can see uh, a lot of a lot of different species here, uh, ranging from copepods, obelia, and tinnifers, and some of those are, I don't even recognize. So like those, and uh, here like kidnets in sort of like a bending mode. It's hard to see see this. Like this is actually the first time I see kidnets doing in this way. So of course we see a lot of larger organisms like uh, uh, krill. This one, this one. This is a sort of like a baby krill in the size similar size of a, a copepod. Then those are Pollock larvae. So uh, what I'm showing here is the system actually give us a pretty good coverage in terms of the organisms that we are interested in. So then I'm moving to the next uh, subtopic, uh, imaging processing part. Uh, because of the imaging system, most of them can operate in at very high frequency, like our system, the neural system can operate in at 60, 65, 6, 65 hertz. In other words, 65 images per second. You think about one hour, how many images we can collect. Roughly, we are looking 200,000 images every hour. But uh, most of the time, I put when I do the operation, I put it in somewhere like a 10 to 15, because compare just with respect to the boat speed as well as towing uh, wind speed. So that seems like a good number. But even in that case, we have roughly 54,000 images per hour. So I did I did count over like a hundred thousand images just for 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 the methods paper to validate my methods, but I swear after that, I get blurry eyes, I swear I don't want to, I don't want to count it again. So uh, we, we start to move on to the Im automated imaging processing part. Those, this actually highlighted the process for any images we start with identifying the potential targets, then may, we move on to uh, how many classes do we have, say, separate animals into different groups? Then we extract features. Then we use those information to train our classifier. Then we move on to automated like a procedure to recognition and the enumeration. So here it listed the main step for each 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 part. Okay. So just to give you a quick idea, so when I say identify the targets, it sounds very easy, just one step, right? But remember the image you saw from Chesapeake Bay. It's a noisy background, and the things are not showing up very well. Here I'm giving you an example. This is an original figure. It hasn't been changed at all. You can see it's, it's quite dark, but you can still see there is a, a hydromedusa here. And there is a copod here, and uh, literally here, and here. So what we did is the first step we developed an adaptive sort of like threshold approach converted to black and white. Then we undergoing remove the noise. Then we use these binary images, use a filter, clean it up some smaller, smaller particulates we are not interested in, we just filtered it out. Then come here, we do the initial classification, say if this particular is, we just leave it out. Then if it's potential targets, we write it out for a future classification. Why we are doing that? Because for the images collected from in, in a high turbid water, there, there is about 99% of particulars in the images will be, you know, non-targets. They're not what you want to see. They're not like uh, animals. So we, in this step, if you want to write it out, it's going to take a lot of time. 
So we adding a filter classifier right here to filter things out. So here then once once you got those potential targets, we move on to describe the features, separate them into different groups, describe their features. In this particular case, I use histogram of gradient to describe their spatial, their shapes. And then we compare those features to the library, then we use a classifier to enumerate it. Uh, this is a, an example showing the results from Chesapeake Bay. Uh, upper panel are all from the automated procedure result, uh, cropped in the Im images. Different kinds of like hydromedusa, then this is different kinds of copepods, and you can see some of them actually carrying egg mass. So uh, for this, for example, this one actually carrying egg mass. Okay, now we have an interface here. I don't recommend you read the, you know, the square letter just because the students were, who work with me is a, is a Chinese. So uh, he wrote it, the interface, user interface in, in Chinese, but uh, this will be becoming, you know, a common, uh, uh, will be in English very soon. Okay. So now I move on two examples very quickly just to show you uh, how I'm using the system to study the process in Chesapeake Bay. And here, this is a middle, middle part of the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, here, this is our, where our lab is, Chesapeake Biological Laboratory, uh, here. Uh, here, what I did is we have four transects. Each transect lasts roughly about 40 minutes from here to from the eastern shore, then turn to western shore, then turn to cross, cross the Chesapeake Bay again. Each transect was roughly about the same time. And uh, the color, color plateau behind of it is showing the chlorophyll concentration in that week. You can roughly see where, the, where you, have, you have a lot of biological features is here on the eastern shore side, right? And uh, there, this side, and uh, on the western shore side, there isn't much uh, biological feature. It's chlorophyll, chlorophyll concentration is relatively low. So let's just go ahead compare the copos abundance in the eastern shore side and the western shore side. Here, this is a, a y-axis showing the depths and. Uh, uh, XX showing the time in that day, basically showing the, the location of the transect. You can associate with uh, the timestamp with the geolocation, but uh, I, I just use two dimension. It's relatively easy, right? With uh, red color, warm color showing the copos abundance, high abundance, cold color, color showing low abundance. So you can see the eastern shore side has a lot of copas, the red color. It's literally like a band going up here, then a lot of going here. Why? Because this is a, the region that the Pataxan River plume actually coming out, push against the eastern shore. We have a lot of like plume structure in this area. Whereas if you look at the western shore side, there wasn't much. If you calculate the average abundance, there was about 10 times difference between the co between the copas abundance. Some location is was even higher than you know a hundred times higher than some locations. So, okay. So the next example I'm going to show you the for the sort of like a long term monitoring application. What we did is we deployed the system uh, in Shenzhen Bay. That's where we we work with a company, build the system, and uh, and uh, test the system right there. So, what happens? We were we were lucky enough when we were testing the system, and we capture a full cycle of Noctiluca blue. Okay, here just showing here showing the location is basically a subtropical water right by Hong Kong. So. 
here those those figures like those upper figures showing before the bloom you can see noctiluca start to showing up but still like uh, in here in those images you can see diatoms and other things but as soon as diet uh, noctiluca showing up this is what happens each dot is one of them so they took over the entire water column you you barely see anything else okay but uh, you do see some strange visitors okay here if uh, i zoomed in for some individuals uh, is pretty interesting ones so those are you can see the cell is actually undergoing division one just turning into uh, two and uh, here uh, this one is actually showing just undergoing the division so you can see the sign whereas when it's fully bloomed each they are all in intact cell so okay so with those uh we got like roughly two uh, for about three weeks we got roughly half million images so i was kind of like ah uh, we don't we couldn't afford the com computational time to do the to processing all the images we just uh, take a subset of the images we processed uh, uh, roughly three images per minute then we averaged over an hour to look for the trend uh, in between these are the time we actually pulled the system out of the water to do the maintenance to look at, to download the data, recharge the battery, and do our regular thing. It took a little bit of time because the bio, uh, sort of like the, uh, the, 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 there are a lot of things attached to the, to the glass windows we held. It took a long, couple of days to clean it up. So what I did is, if you look at it, those are the beginning. It's very low abundance then this is a, when it's in full bloom, high abundance. So I, with those kind of data, we can easily feed some classical growth model, for example, logistic growth model. Then we can make simple forecast, what is the chance for the bloom to occur, right? So that's kind of like a, where we are heading to for, for now, okay? So, that, with that, I'm concluding the first part for the optical system, and I'm moving on to the forage, part, the forage fish part, and then CNET all part. So uh, I guess why we want we care about forage fish, those forage species, sea nettles, manhattan, and mysis. If you look at forage fish, this is a typical school. And they, this is a sea lands swimming through likely as sardine schools. And if you look at the lower, lower figure here, it highlights the importance of forage fish because large economically important fish actually rely them to, uh, to, to grow and survive. At the same time, for lower trophic levels, they rely on forage fish to transfer the energy to, to, a, to a higher trophic levels. Uh, come down to specific species, like for Manhattan, this is actually the largest fisheries by catch in the east coast of the United States. And uh, why we care, uh, the next part is I've pulled the objectives for, for Atlantic sea nettles and for fish together. So for Atlantic Manhattan, we want to answer two questions. Are those forage fish, because they are coastal spawner, they migrate back to Chesapeake Bay to grow for a year, then they move out. So the question is like, are they utilizing the shallow creek habitat or are they using river stem habitat or, uh, you know, like bay stem habitat? And then, of course, we want to test whether we can actually use sonar imaging system to do this. And the four C nettles is we want to look at to understand their source, where are they coming from, and how do we understand their population dynamics, because that's one of the emerging 
problems for many ecosystems, although there are arguments whether it's actually occurring more or not, that's still uncertain. But we, we need more information to understand their dynamics. So this uh, here, I'm just going to go through this, uh, this figure here. For the lower figure, what you can see, it actually highlights how we are sampling the near shore forage species, forage species now. Uh, one way to sample it, you sample really close shore. You use the same survey. You got two people like uh, pull the net, you surround the fish in the middle of the, wherever your net is going to close. However, that is limited by the, the height of the net. Most of the time, this same survey is just a net is just about one, 1 1.2 meter height. And, or you can use your boat to do your survey. As, when, as soon as you move on your boat, you, you cannot go too shallow. Particularly the boats actually dragging the, can dragging the nets to sample fish. They require, often requires at least five to six meter water depths to operate. So that leaves a, the range from, literally from one meter depth to six meter depths unsampled. And you can, you can also make in the case, when you sample, you probably did not sample them very well. So what we, the sonar imaging system we used is, is quite small, it's straightforward, it's similar to the acoustic, uh, acoustic, any other acoustic instrument, except it has an acoustic lens that converts the binary information into sort of like a near video quality image. And we tow the system along the boat, on the, on the side of the boat, with the boat going one, two, two nautical miles, and, and we sample throughout the entire water column. In that way, we can continuously sample those both forage fish and sea nettles. Okay. At the same time, the system can retain size and uh, uh, volume information, allows us to calibrate for uh, you know, different sampling volume for each frame. Okay. So, this is a, just a figure showing how we are doing the sampling. And uh, again, small boat here. And here, I'm just going to show the study map for, this is the first time I'm showing the next uh, next slides. For CNET, I will show that too. So our focus is here. You can see that's Leonard Creek. And then this is a Patuxent River, three different colors. Uh, we call the yellow one as Upper Patuxent River tra uh, uh, Transect, then the lower one, Lower Patuxent River Transect. Uh, as I stated, our primary purpose is to look at where the, where the forage species, schooling species, where they utilize creek or river stem. Then if we know where they, are, where they utilize uh, the habitat, then we can just map their habitat to estimate their biomass. So here, this is an example of the f uh, fish we are looking. Uh, here, this is a bottom we are seeing sediment, and the boat is going this way. So just to highlight here, this is a bottom, and the boat is going this way. Those are Manhattan schooling. Okay. So we average fish every 10 seconds because we take picture, uh, 15 pictures every second to avoid repeat counts. We average, average them so to avoid those. So we end up with the index of abundance in the water column. So here I'm showing, upper panel I'm showing in red, I'm showing the average of sort of like abundance across the summer. From, from May until August. You see the difference is just about twice. It's actually, for, for forage fish, it's pretty darn good. It's a relatively stable estimates. If you look at the data from the same net, it varied up to 100 times. And you look at the trawl data, they are in the same nature, varied about up to 100 times. So 
you see this is actually it's not bad overall the the highest and the, the lowest is about two times difference by August because the fruit when they grow up they move into deeper deeper channels so that's another issue here so the lower panel with the green bar showing the average fish abundance in the creek and the blue bar showing the average abundance in the Patuxent River in the river channel so you can see where they choose to stay there are a couple instance instance like uh, the they they were actually lower in the creek higher than than the river channel we'll talk about that towards the end there are some particular reasons because of the sea nettles bloomed at that time they drive the fish out of the, their optimal habitat okay. so the next part we fit in a GAM model to look at how does the fish abundance varies with water depths remember I at the beginning we showed that we have this sampling issues with forage schooling fish near shore forage schooling fish so we want to see how much of the biomass that, that we actually missed. Okay, so the structure of the model is the same. I, I will just go through once. The next for a scene at all is the same. Basically, you have your counts, you have your habitat type, then you have time, you have a spatial location. Okay, so of course we cracked it for sam uh, sampling volume. So here, this is showing the water types. If you look at the creek water types, it's mostly 6 to 12 feet. And uh, again, goes back to the area that we did not sample. And uh, for the river channel, they have a wide range of water depths, but only a portion of them are actually you can sample with, with trawl. So they're, most of them are not also not deep enough. And uh, the next part, you can see the upper panel showing the uh, showing the results, model results, and observed results for the creek, with green dots showing the observed value, with the black line showing the simulated results from the model, and the red box I highlight highlighted the depths from one meter to two meter to five meter depths. That's where we did not sample at all. Okay, here we are not talking about like how well Sane is doing. We're simply talking about, you know, where we did not sample. See, you see a lot of fish in this depth strata. And then, if when you move to the river channel, there are even more fish in this in this strata than any other depth range. And here, this is a this table actually showing showing the positive catch in terms of depths in the creek. What you can see, the percentage of positive catch in the creek is relatively stable across different depth strata. In other words, if you go shallow, say less than one meter depth, two meter depths, you get roughly 17, uh, 17 point 17 point uh, 14 point uh, percent positive catch then you move to the the strata 1.2 to 4 meters you get 18 percent it's relatively stable but when you move to the river channel you only have roughly three to five percent of positive catch so i think it's highlighting where they are using as their primary habitat uh, I think the conclusion for this part is relatively straightforward. I'm not going to repeat it. So basically, a sonar system is a pretty good tool to, to, to should do this work. And the next part, I'm going to move on to the sea nettle part, because that's a lot of the ecosystems, is it, uh, you know, the emerging problems from many ecosystems. And uh, quite often, we cannot use uh, use nettles to sample jellyfish very well because they are so patchy in the water column and uh, of course they are jello it's easily bro broke so uh, again using the sonar system what you can see actually the imaging system worked pretty well here we have uh, showing that showing that the sea nettles showing up in different uh, frames with 
here, one or two, one. So they sh either showing up in school or showing up in the individual format. Uh, so the other thing is this year, 2017, we sample more clicks than uh, 2016. We want to see whether we, what we see in one creek will be hold on the other creek. At the same time, those creeks has different uh, land use. For example, uh, la the one we sampled uh, in 2016, this one, has a lot of la uh, farmland as well as forest coverage, whereas this one here, Kakaold, Oh, sorry. This is Leonard Creek. This is Kakao I'm talking about. Has a lot of commercial residential housing. So, I mean, if we have preliminary, preliminary data for forage, for forage fish too, it turns out forage fish abundance is much higher in those uh, with for, uh, creek with land, farmland as well as forest coverage. It's much lower here with residential housing, okay. So again, here just showing how we do the counts for, for sea nettles. It, each uh, yellow circle indicates one sea nettle is passing through. And uh, here, this is uh, again showing the bottom here. This is the bottom. So both going in this way, okay. So, Again, for, for this figure, I'm just showing the relative abundance of sea nettles in the creek versus the river channel. The overall message is they are super abundant in the creek. They are about 100 times up to, actually in some cases, up to 500 times higher than in the river channel. Uh, why this is uh, surprising? Because they were typically considered as weak swimmer. Right, you would imagine that they will be adapted to the main stem, and so we should be able, we should see similar abundance or similar biomass in the in the main stem, but it turns out it's a big surprise. So here this uh, this figure showing the sequential time over time how the distribution of sea nettles the Upper panel, I will just go through the upper panel so you know the structure here. The upper panel, this is depth. This is a distance going from the starting point of the transects to the creek mouth. Then here, this is a middle panel showing the, the transect right by the creek mouth. Then this one showing the lower, the one after the lower Patuxent River transect. So the idea is with this, the middle panel can tell us how many individuals being adapted out. And the changes along the transect, the uh, concentration gradient will also tell us the dispersal rate from the, from the source to the creek mouth. So you can look at the figure over from the upper panel to lower panel you can see the seasonal pattern. They are become most abundant in July, and then they decline. And uh, you can also see the spatial pattern with deep, with blue color. Deep blue indicates higher abundance. Shallow blue indicates lower abundance. We just uh, skipped all the zero observations. So just in this way, you can see they mostly concentrated in the upper creek, right? Rather than being, say, homogeneous evenly distributed or being adapted towards the mouth. So overall, those if we use, say, the transect abundance at the creek mouth as a proxy for uh, for dispersal ones, it's only the highest time is roughly 20%. Okay. So uh, this is, a, we start to look at the spatial patterns with, uh, with respect to habitat. Uh, you can look at the trends, uh, the impact of the creek versus channel, okay? I'm, I'm just going to skip through this really relatively quick, so you, it seems like I'm running out of time. You can see the gradient. 
it, the spatial model actually, if you look at the upper, upper panel showing, it captured the gradient pr pretty well. It's declining, the abundance declining over, t uh, over as, as soon as you go, go down to the creek. Okay. The channel, you have similar pattern, mostly concentrated on the, uh, at the creek mouth, where here. So if we do simple calculation, uh, we can look at the how many how many individuals in the in the creek and versus in in the channel based on the habitat type. So you can see that there is a huge difference between the average abundance. Overall, most of them are in the creek, uh, about a hundred times difference. In terms of a concentration. Okay, the next part, we saw so many different things, and uh, one thing is they are not independent from each other. Okay, this figure, the 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 left three panels showing the distribution of mices. Here you can see. Uh, let me go ahead and start the video. Uh, pay attention to here, this again, the bottom. Pay attention to this part. So you will see mice is showing up here, formulate a huge swarm. Yeah, they're coming up. Yeah. Right. So those kind of swarms, there is no way you can sample with nets. And uh, the biomass, if you do the calculation, they probably are bigger than the copepods or phytoplankton in the entire creek. So this is something that we were not able to quantify at all. So something needs to be considered, definitely needs to be considered in the ecosystem modeling side. Okay, so when we look at their dis spatial distribution, if you look at mice's distribution, this is a Left hand side, right hand side, the red square showing Manhattan distribution, and uh, yellow, uh, blue dots showing sea nettles. Just pay attention to the Manhattan and uh, and the sea nettles. If you look at it, even they both showing up in the creek, Manhattan literally are avoiding sea nettles. And here, as soon as sea nettles gone, Manhattan move in. And when the sea nettles completely gone, mice is moving, and uh, uh, Manhattan moves in. So those are the kind of like ecological interactions we were not able to consider before, before we have this kind of data, right? Because most of the time we look at the trophic interaction, interactions through the predator prey, see how much they eat. We by do, by looking at those data, we know that actually sea nettles can drive the, the other species out of their optimum habitat because creek has higher food concentration and uh, you know probably they can survive better as roughage. There are a lot of benefits staying in the cr creek, but they were driving out, out of the, their optimum habitat. What are the ecological consequences there? So, okay. I'm going to conclude my talk with another new toy that we just got. is a fancy uh, four-dimensional time-resolved tomographic Im imaging system. That system will, this system will allow us to, for example, put larval fish and copepods in the same tank. We, were, we will be able to check their swimming behavior, their interactions. Then we can bring the information from the lab to interpret the, interpret the data from the field. Of course, without support, there is no way to do this work. I'm, I'm not going to repeat all those acknowledgments. I think you probably can read faster than I, than I read. So with this, I'm going to conclude my talk and take questions.
precise way to be practical to see with your shadow graph imaging system? Uh, so the pixel, the question for is, what are the size range that we can see using the shadow graph imaging system? Uh, it varies a lot depending on which system you are talking about. For example, ISIS system has a pixel resolution, original system has a pixel resolution 72 micrometers. It can see things up to, in theory, up to 10 centimeters. The newer version they put out by attaching a fine, higher resolution line scan camera, they were able to have a pixel resolution at 36 micrometer. And uh, the other system, line scan system of CIPR from the University of South Florida has a pixel resolution at roughly 70. For our system has a resolution at uh, the, the the previous version has pixel resolution at 10 micrometer up to 3.5 centimeter range. Uh, in other words, you, we need roughly 10 uh, pixels to see things clear. So in other words, four or five, when you have four or five pixels, you can start to see the shape of the animals. So we consider somewhere we can see things from 40 to 60 micrometers up to 3.5 centimeters. So, yeah, welcome. So why were the populations a lot lower near the residential area than in the creek area that you guys focused on studying? So the, uh, the question here is why the uh, population, including forage fish and the sea nettles population, are much lower in the creek in the creeks with residential area than with the creeks with forest and uh, from uh, uh, farmland. Uh, this is relates to the realities. Number one, what we found is the creeks with land use, forest coverage, uh, farmland and the forest coverage, they tend to have much higher con uh, phytoplankton concentration as well as zooplankton concentration, which makes sense. Then at the same time, uh, it potentially relates to the retention time uh, what we found is, for example, for sea nettle studies, we deployed artificial sediment tower, uh, set, settlement tower allow their polyps settle on those tower. We also found is in the creek that we have, uh, say in the Leonard Creek where we have a lot of polyps attachment, whereas in other creek where the retention rate is low, then it, the population tends to be low. So there are, there are many factors potentially affecting the results. So we are right now, we are at the, still sort of like in the preliminary stage to, to look at our data. There is a question. We have a question from our online um, listeners, Jay Peterson. He says, Dr. Bai, any estimate on what percent of images are able to be correctly identified? I assume the images you show in your presentation are the best of the best, and there are many that are of orientation that make the organism hard to ID and are eliminated as noise. Any comparison with nets for copepods? Okay. Uh, this goes back to how do we compare the imaging system with the net. And this has been done all the time. And for example, they have done this comparison between Makonets and Video Plankton Recorder in early 1990s. Then as soon as ISIS come out, they also has done the comparison. And uh, CIPR has done the comparison too. And the famous title I want to cite is what you see, what you catch is not what you see because of avoidance. In other words, if we want to really compare the, what, you, what you see in the imaging system versus you, what you catch in the 
net systems, you are literally comparing somewhere like it compared to apple to orange. Because net, for example, we all know half meter net, larger copos will have avoidance. Whereas for the imaging system, we always have this like streamlined design, minimize turbulence. You know, we would imagine that the avoidance will be much less a problem. Uh, that's the first first part of the question. Actually, the second part of the question. Now I move on to the first part of the question. Uh, it's actually a very good question. Uh, there are two parts of the two parts of the information hiding in that particular question. Is uh, remember the system only had a certain depth of field say from the middle part, uh, the, the new system we have the focused point plane is in the middle of the two windows. If you go five centimeters towards left, go five centimeters towards right, those are the regions you can get like in focused images. As soon as you get out of that range, the image will become blur. So those are the type of, the, when it becomes really blur, blur, we cannot identify them. Literally, they are, has the same like pixel strength. Like we look at the gray level, they will be the same as your background. So you cannot count those. But at the same time, we are not in the automated procedure. We are not counting those. We crack the volume just using the focal, focused area. For the, for the second, um, uh, point in that question is because Copas has different orientation, sometimes they come in the camera, you know, like we, we get dorsal view, we got head view. Uh, that part is not a problem. As soon as, as long as your human eyes can identify that's a Copas, we can incorporate that information in the library then the computer will be able to recognize. So remember, for the automated imaging process, procedure, what we want to check is always the major morphological features. Say, we will not, most of the cases, we were not able to go down to species. We go by, you see, I use, use either class or groups. So. For, for example, for copas, we're looking at whether they have antenna, whether they have this like tube-shaped body. So they have certain features that we are looking at it. So in other words, uh, as long as you don't go down to the fine like a taxonomic level, I think the counts should be fine. And plus, uh, the downs uh, the advantage with computer doing things is cons consistent, right? With human, like uh, you and the experts can't do the counts. And I think uh, there are people who have done the experiments, you have the taxonomy specialist counting the same samples over time. Within half, hour, half an hour, the, extra, the consistency dropped down to like uh, 85%. As you can imagine, you go beyond an hour, how much is going to drop. So there are, you know, uh, there are upside, there are downside. The downside is we cannot go down to species level most of the time, unless, you know, like jellyfish, there are only a few dominant species in certain regions. And for example, mice, if we are sampling in the upper bay, we know there are most of them, are probably 90% of them are uh, Americanas, and for copas in the upper bay, we, you know, summertime, probably most of them are Kasha Tonsha. You would just guess it, it's not going to be far off. So those are the special cases we can go down to species, but uh, the, most of the time, uh, imaging system cannot go down to species level.